Okay, before I get started, I just want to get a couple things out of the way. First of all, don't forget to like and subscribe because it'll make me happy and it'll make you happy because you made someone else happy. Secondly, I absolutely love the Persona games. They're some of the best Japanese role-playing games ever made. The stories, the characters and their amazing designs, the psychological themes and imagery, some of which is very overt. The soundtracks, the slick and creative menu designs, the relationships, everything about the games are just beautiful. Despite each game being super long, every time I finish a Persona game I immediately want more. I even sank over 150 hours into Persona 5 Royal and when it came to an end I just wanted to stay in its world a little bit longer. So I got the spin-off dancing game. I don't know why either. I cannot speak highly enough about the Persona franchise. Some of my fondest memories in my long time of playing video games have been thanks to this franchise, and I cannot wait to see what the future holds in store for it. I can say without a shadow of a doubt that I am a fan. However, I have some, let's say, qualms with the series, specifically the recent entries, Persona 5 and Persona 5 Royal, the enhanced edition of the game. Now, the reason I started the video explaining my credentials and my love for the franchise is that I wanted to make it clear that it is perfectly possible to be critical of something, yet love it at the same time. If you've seen my video on Queer Eye, then you'll be familiar with what I mean by this. Ideally, I shouldn't have to start a video this way, but I am also aware that the gaming community, and to some extent the anime community, isn't particularly fond of someone picking apart something that they love, especially if that person isn't familiar with it or perhaps even loves it as much as they do. But trust me when I say I do love the Persona games. Look, here's a screenshot of my playtime. I got every character to level 99, maxed out every confidant with the exception of Shinya, I maxed out my social stats, I got a platinum trophy. I can't claim to be an expert at the game, but I'm most certainly familiar with it. I also played through Persona 4 Golden again recently, and a few years ago I played Persona 3 Portable on the PSP, and I played through Persona 3 FES on the PS2, so yeah, I'm a fan. I don't think anyone can question that really. My personal take is that if you are a fan of something, be it a video game, TV show, band, singer, movie franchise, etc, being critical of it is a good thing. Because not only does it help you recognize what makes something great, it also helps you recognize how something could improve. If you're a fan of something, then you have no obligation to believe that it's great regardless of its missteps. For example, let's say you have a band that you love. They release two albums that are flawless, but then they release a third and it just doesn't appeal to you in the way that the first two did. Maybe they went in a different direction sound-wise that didn't work out, or they had a change in band members, whatever. If you're a fan of that band, like you've been to multiple shows, you own their merch, you recommend them to friends, do you tell yourself that it's another flawless album and those who criticize it aren't real fans? Or do you let it be known that despite your love for this band, this album simply had its problems? I know this has happened to me multiple times, and as much as I'd like to believe that Radiohead's King of Limbs is an underrated masterpiece, or Space Force is Greg Daniel's best work and no one gets it, I know if I tried to think this way then I'd be lying to myself. This also applies to Persona 5. As much as I love this game and its predecessors, there are problems. Not just from a gameplay perspective, but how it represents certain things. The series is heavily rooted in Japanese culture, and Japan doesn't have a great track record in regards to how women, people of colour, and LGBTQ people are seen in society and represented. Persona 5 and its successor Royal also happen to fall foul of these representations on a few occasions. In this video though, we're going to focus on Persona 5's objectification of women, specifically how it succeeds in being critical of objectification, but then paradoxically goes on to promote it throughout the rest of the game. If you're someone who just heard what I said and rolled your eyes, well, take your time and hear me out. I might just steal your heart. To those already familiar with the Persona franchise, I've included a timecode in the description if you want to skip this section. 
But to give a brief overview of Persona 5 Royal and to an extent the other entries in the franchise, the games are sort of a hybrid of Japanese role playing game or JRPG and a social simulator. You play a second year high school student who's just been moved to another school and have to remain there for the coming year. You start out barely knowing anyone, but along the way you encounter people you become friends with, some of which will join your party and some you can enter relationships with. A supernatural incident occurs and you and the friends that you gather along the way have to battle against the forces of evil, which in the case of Persona 5 are those whose hearts have become so corrupted with greed, lust or power that their ego has constructed a literal palace to safeguard that which they hold most precious to them. You and your friends become the Phantom Thieves, or in my case, the Booty Wizards, and you are given a power to enter these palaces, defeat its ruler, which happens to be a cognition of the real life counterpart, steal their treasure, resulting in them having a change of heart and confessing to all their sins. These are super long games, so believe me when I say that this is a very brief explanation. There's so many more elements to the game, like building up your social stats, including knowledge, guts, proficiency, kindness and charm, doing part-time jobs, befriending people outside of your party, doing various activities including batting cages, darts, pool, exercising, playing video games and so on. There's so much to do in these games that not a day goes by that you're unable to develop an aspect of yourself or be productive, and frankly my character's absurd productivity makes me feel a bit insecure. I'd stick a riddle in just to write and edit this video. A part of the game that I want to talk about first happens in the very early stages. Shortly after starting at your new school, the prestigious Shujin Academy, your character, who you can name whatever you want, but for the sake of this video I'll call him Akira since that's what he's called in the manga, ends up having a chance meeting with another student, Ryuji. The two are late to school one day and butt heads with the school's volleyball coach and ex-Olympian, Suguru Kamashida. After a series of events, Akira and Ryuji stumble across the supernatural realm known as the Metaverse and discover Kamoshida's palace. This palace, along with every other antagonist in the game, is a manifestation of their desires. It's a distortion on how they see the world and the people around them, but we'll get back to that soon. One thing that's revealed about Kamoshida is that not only has he been physically abusing his students during practice sessions, but he's been sexually harassing and abusing female students too. However, due to his prestigious background and good standing with the rest of the staff, the students feel powerless to act against him. The victims of Kamashida that we're made aware of include Ryuji, whose leg was injured by him, thus bringing his potential as a runner to a halt, and Yuki Mishima, also a victim of physical abuse. Kamashida also sexually harasses Ann Takamaki, a female student. He makes advances at her on numerous occasions and tries to blackmail her into sleeping with him in exchange for keeping Ann's best friend Shiho Suzui in the volleyball team. After Ann rejects him, it's heavily implied that Kamashida then sexually assaulted Shiho, who later in a state of despair and hopelessness attempts to take her own life by jumping off the roof of the school. You and your party realize that your best chance at stopping Kamashida and forcing him to confess his crimes is to enter the palace and steal his treasure, thus forcing a change of heart. Kamashida's palace contains a cognitive representation of how he sees the world, specifically the school. He sees himself as the king and this is his castle. At the bottom there's the dungeon where dozens of students are literally being tortured. The main floors, which are adorned with imagery of Kamashida looking powerful and regal, and the upper levels, which for the sake of this argument is most noteworthy, since it represents Kamashida's lust for his female students. The most prominent decorations you'll see in this area are statues of the female form in skimpy sports attire, leaning over with their rear ends sticking out and a heart shape covering their buttocks. They have no head, legs or arms, suggesting that their identity is irrelevant and that they're powerless. In some areas the statues will rotate as you move around them to ensure that their butts are always facing you, and in other areas they can even be used such as being able to climb them. It's worth noting that at this point, the game is in no way suggesting that you as a player or the character that you're playing as are meant to see this as an aesthetically pleasing or indeed arousing situation. Kamoshida is a disgusting character who has abused his power and the game wants to make it clear that it doesn't promote his actions. Shortly after Anne is captured, we also see Kamoshida's cognition of her, 
except she's wearing a skimpy swimsuit, cat ears, and exists entirely to dote upon him. This enrages Anne so much that she finally achieves the power to fight back. The group eventually confronts Kamashida as the final boss, who has transformed into a grotesque cognition of his real self, Shadow Kamashida. The arena is adorned with the female statues that we've seen throughout the palace. Along with wearing a crown and a cape, he spawned horns from his head, wielding a glass of wine in one hand and a riding crop in another, a reference to him physically abusing his students. He's also spawned two more arms, wielding a gold knife and a fork. Two standout features of this design, though, is the trophy that's in front of him, in which we see the legs of female students sticking out and writhing around. When he loses a certain amount of his health, he'll take an opportunity to pick up one of these girls with a fork and eat them to heal. The other standout design feature of Shadow Kamashida is his gigantic white tongue. An interesting aspect of this fight is that Kamashida has an attack named Lick, and this will always be targeted at Anne, the only female member of your party. He telegraphs the attack beforehand so players can react to this in time, but if they fail to do so, Lick is one of the most damaging attacks in his arsenal. As the fight is nearing the end, Shadow Kamashida summons cognitions of two students, Mishima, who I mentioned previously was a victim of Kamashida's physical abuse, and then Shiho, the student Kamashida drove to attempt suicide, is brought in to assist him with a special attack. The Persona games have some incredible boss designs, and Kamashida is no exception. It illustrates this disgusting, lecherous being who abuses his power with no remorse. The world and everything in it exists simply to please him, and young women aren't just objects to him, they provide him sustenance, regardless of their own well-being. After the fight ends, a scene plays out where the party confronts a defeated Kamashida, who believes that given the pressure the school has put upon him to ensure the volleyball team excels, that because he's had to put up with that, he should be given a reward, i.e. women. The team are faced with the decision to kill Kamashida, but leave it up to Anne to choose since she was his victim. She lets him know how damaging his actions have been, and decides to let him live in order to confess and atone for his sins. They steal that which he treasures the most, or as the game puts it, they steal his heart, then leave as the palace crumbles around them. This is a genuinely powerful and impactful moment. It may be under supernatural circumstances, but it still does a great job of conveying that women don't exist to please the powerful, that their gender shouldn't mean that they don't lack like power themselves, and that the patriarchal institution of the school, and to an extent the country, has not only given power to Kamashida, but convinced him that he deserves more power. No, please wait. I beg you. Just forgive me. Shut up. I bet everyone told you the same. But you, you took everything from us! After some time passes, Kamashida publicly confesses his crimes during a school assembly. He's genuinely remorseful for what he's done and announces that to repent, he's going to take his own life. Anne calls him out on this, demanding that he faces the consequences for his crimes, and that despite Shiho's attempted suicide, she wants to live regardless of what happened to her. He also admits that he tried to force Anne into relations with him, which quells the rumours that she and Kamashida were in a mutual relationship. The whole storyline is how the game opens. In its very early stages, it unequivocally tells us, the audience, that what Kamashida has done is disgusting and unforgivable, and we should be as disgusted and outraged as the characters who have experienced it. It's extremely effective at this too. I personally remember how eager I was to defeat this monster when the time came. The game set a precedent that what this predator has done, how he sees the world, abuses people and objectifies women, is completely unacceptable, and it did it in a remarkable way. But then, the rest of the game happens, and much of that messaging goes straight out of the window. Female objectification isn't something that's entirely uncommon in video games, and indeed anime. In fact, you could argue that it's rampant, especially in the latter. There have been endless debates about how women are presented in the media, and in Japanese media, specifically anime, it tends to be the case that female characters are often portrayed in a way that accentuates their anatomy. Skimpy clothing that's sometimes revealing a good amount of skin, large breasts, slim figures, and shapely butts. 
Sometimes the creators try to justify the clothing through story or themes, like how in Kill la Kill, Ryuko's battle outfit, or Kamui, is so skimpy because the fibers feed off the blood of the wearer, and if it covers less surface area, it keeps them from being overwhelmed by it. It's definitely one hell of a logical leap, but the justification is about as flimsy as the outfits, especially when this is the transformation scene. You know, I'm just gonna stop it there, I don't want to get demonetized. One theory I'd like to talk about that's relevant to how women are portrayed in media is the male gaze. Another. Male gaze. This theory was created by feminist film critic Laura Mulvey. She claimed that the male gaze is when women in film, and by extension all visual media, are portrayed through the lens of a heterosexual male. This occurs via three perspectives, one through the eyes of the creator, one through the male characters within the media in question, and lastly the perspective of the audience. Because all forms of media are largely dominated by men, it means that the way we see women in media as a whole has created a standard in how they are represented, and that standard has been set by men. Some people argue that even within media made by female producers, the male gaze can still be present, as their works may have been influenced by male-produced media, thus perpetuating the standard created by men. As early as Kamoshida's palace, we get an example of the male gaze. When characters in Persona 5 awaken to their powers, or their persona, they undergo a transformation where they're given an outfit which is supposed to represent them. Akira and Ryuji are the first to awaken. Both of them wear outfits designed to show you how cool and tough they are. Prominent angular features and hints that they offer some kind of protection. Anne, however, is bestowed with this as an outfit. Yes, the character who has been objectified by the game's current antagonist is given a skin-tight leather catsuit that accentuates the bust. It also has a zipper, which really has to be uncomfortable, right? Ryuji comments upon how Anne looks by saying, But damn! And when deciding upon a codename for her, one of the options is Sexy Cat. However, it's a throwaway option as Anne's codename is Panther by default. I also want to mention that outside of school and fighting Freudian foes, Anne is a part-time model. The game makes it clear that Anne is an attractive young woman that catches the eyes of many people, and she's aware of it too. She understands that beauty has value and wants to develop a career in which she can make money from her genetic blessings. There are many arguments within feminist theory that claim modeling in itself is a form of exploitation, that much like the rest of media, it's subject to the male gaze, and the choice of models and fashion that they wear are chosen to appeal to men. Some claim that it's empowering, in that giving women a platform in which they can influence culture moves the power balance closer to their favor. But you could also argue that in a society that's dominated by the patriarchy, women may have to lie to themselves that they're reclaiming their sexuality in order to more comfortably pander to the male gaze, which is honestly a super depressing take and personally I don't subscribe to it. It's a huge topic that's been discussed for about a century now and I won't get into it here, but the point is, Anne has chosen this path. She decided that she is fine with the world admiring her for her beauty, and she knows how people see her. I'm sure that some people would argue that because Anne is accepting of the world seeing her as a beautiful person, then we as an audience shouldn't see it as a problem when the game does so too. The problem here though is that when the game objectifies her, it's done to titillate the audience. Even on occasions where she expresses that she doesn't consent to being objectified, two notable instances being during a fireworks festival cutscene where the boys peep at Anne showing her leg, what is this, the 1920s? and later on where they're driving in the desert and they peek down her shirt. These scenes are both animated, created outside of the game's engine. Overall, there's just over an hour's worth of scenes in this style throughout the game. So given that the game can be upwards of 100 hours, these moments are sparse. It's telling that in these rare occasions when we're treated to an animated scene, there are numerous inclusions of female characters being objectified for the sake of the audience, and it's especially uncomfortable when the target of objectification is a character that was the target of a predator. In Persona 5's defense, there are parts of the story where female objectification and exploitation are further admonished. In an early part of the game, one of your party members, Makoto, is blackmailed by a figurehead in an organized crime group. 
and told that if she and her friends are unable to pay him a large sum of money, then as a consequence he'll force her into sex work and make him various comments on how a girl like her would get a lot of clients. It's another example of a powerful man exerting their power over women. A high school student named Hifumi is a professional shogi player, but because of her appearance her mother wants to further her career by turning her into an idol, but Hifumi wants to be recognised for her talent rather than her beauty. Oh hey, I did a video on that recently. Also, a few Persona fans out there, a fun little fact for you. Hifumi was actually originally supposed to be a party member. I think she would have been a good fit. Another character, Haru, is denied her autonomy when her CEO father arranges a marriage between her and the son of a potential business associate. Despite her being against the arrangement and having no attraction to her fiancé, he makes constant unwanted advances at her, criticises her appearance and behaviour, and a major part of Haru's growth as a character is rejecting not only her vulgar fiancé, but rejecting the outdated patriarchal institution of arranged marriages, and being a bargaining chip for a corporation. But despite these efforts to empower its female characters, Persona 5 unfortunately takes two steps forward and one step back. By taking these characters and repurposing them into eye candy, they diminish the value of the message they're trying to communicate to their audience. You think so? It's good that the game highlighted how reprehensible it is when people in power like Kamashida abuse their power and exploit women for their own gain, how he sees them then little else than their bodies, but that message is unfortunately undercut when the game contains a beach scene. A staple scene within anime includes close-up shots of Anne's butt and breasts. You can also excuse it by saying that this is supposed to be how the boys in the game see her, but that would still be abiding by the male gaze, and more importantly, the scene hasn't been created for the boys. Anne hasn't been created for them either. They've been created for us, the audience. To wrap things up, I want to make a clarification. Firstly, I am not saying that overtly sexual character designs are a bad thing, nor am I saying that being titillated by a design is bad. One thing I love about the Persona series is the fantastic character designs. In fact, I would go as far as to say that the lead character designer of the Persona series, Shigenori Soejima, is one of the best artists in the business because he does such a good job at communicating who a character is through every aspect of them, from their hair to their clothes and their costumes. Characters such as Anne and Makoto may be wearing skin-tight clothing that highlights their bodies, but it doesn't mean that they're bad designs. In another context, a costume like Anne's could be seen as someone reclaiming their sexuality, despite the fact that she had been previously objectified by a predator. But because Persona 5 insists upon sexualizing these characters rather than being visually appealing while taking ownership of their sexuality, it shifts the power dynamic towards the player, and it doesn't merely permit them to sexualize them, but it encourages them, regardless of their gender. Okay, there was a lot of flowery sounding academic language in there, so let me try and simplify things a little bit. If all the aspects of Anne, such as her character, her design, her costumes, and even a storyline between her and Kamashida remained intact, then it would help recontextualize her character. It would mean that how she looks represents who she is and give her autonomy and full ownership over her appearance, rather than part of her existing to titillate the audience. She would have still been a product of the male gaze, that's unavoidable, but she also would have been a very well-written character with thoughts, feelings, and power. And by objectifying her, what we do in essence is remove some of her power and pass it over to the audience instead. In other words, and deserve better. Many games within the industry are created by largely straight male staffs, and with that comes a narrow scope of perspectives. It's not often that we see characters and stories through the lens of women, non-binary or even transgender folks, so at times it can seem impossible to view a game outside of the perspective of a straight male. I myself am a straight male and I can tell when I'm being pandered to, clearly since I made this whole video. But handing that perspective to people from different genders can allow us the opportunity to see characters in a way that they want their gender to be represented. I don't want you to think that this means that every female character should be completely covered up. I'm certain that many women can attest to the fact that they also enjoy some designs that highlight the assets of female characters. 
There's a trope in massively multiplayer online RPGs that when playing as a female avatar, the higher the level of your armor, the more revealing it becomes, making it sort of a reward for getting so far while in reality being massively impractical. It's silly and it's obviously pandering, but my wife and many other women I've spoken to have said that while they recognize the intention behind these designs, they actually like them because they think it looks good and honestly, that's fine. No one has a right to say what you should find visually appealing. I know I don't. It would be nice if these games offered options in how you present your characters for those who aren't too keen on those designs and perhaps, you know, make something that's a bit more practical for them. But I'm not saying that designers shouldn't be allowed to make characters with sex appeal. But context does matter and Persona 5 unfortunately created dissonance between its female characters and its message on their treatment. Studying how video games or indeed media objectifies women in particular isn't a new or even groundbreaking subject, and it's something that hasn't always been embraced with open arms, lest we forget. But Persona 5 is an interesting case in that early into the game we're given a well-crafted narrative that the objectification of women is wrong and robs them of their power. But it quickly pivots on that message and tells the audience, check out these teenage girls, they're pretty hot, right? Boy, that felt gross to say, please don't take that out of context. With gratuitous shots of body parts, male characters being sleazy and jiggling breast physics in some of the game's animated segments, namely the Showtime attacks, Persona 5 and Royal have their great message crushed under the need to please male audiences. There are many anime shows and video games that objectify their female characters unabashedly without any attempts at empowering them. And in cases where this involves a powerful female character, some fans like to excuse that by saying that because they have this power, objectifying them doesn't make a difference. But unfortunately, that isn't the case. Because the power dynamic is ultimately between the creator and the audience, and reducing a character to their physical assets ignores who that character is as a person, regardless of their power. There are plenty of women, trans and non-binary people who watch anime, play video games and love Persona, and may even enjoy how these female characters are shown. I'm not here to criticize how people enjoy something, but we can still do a lot better than this. We can include powerful messages in media that resonate with people without undermining them because of their gender, sexuality or even race. There's been some strides in recent years when it comes to giving creators from various backgrounds a voice, but in Japan where Persona 5 was produced, that growth has been insignificant. And it's no coincidence that women and everyone else are seen as less than men in Japan. I love Persona 5 and all the other games in the franchise that I've played. I truly do. These games have some of the best written characters I've seen in a video game. I can see myself in some of them, and I see people I know in them too. On many occasions, I genuinely cared about them. It's clear that the people who wrote and designed these characters also cared about them too, given how well they fleshed them out. But when you put your respect for your characters aside in order to appeal to an audience that you belong to, you undermine your message on how the world mistreats them. And that's not only unfair to your creation, but it's unfair to those who your creation represents. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, then please subscribe to my channel, leave a like and maybe a comment. I do read them all. My last video about talent belonging to the beautiful somehow blew up recently and I'm just blown away by the wonderful response to it. Um, it's my first video to reach almost 300,000 views and we've also surpassed 30,000 subscribers. I'm legitimately astounded that so many of you like my work and it really does mean the world to me. You, you're all helping me achieve something that I'd love to keep doing full time and I can't thank you enough. Your support has been incredible. I'd also like to thank my wonderful Patreon supporters. Tamara, Chaitan Kuima, Butchfink, Disregulated, Speep, Lou, Marius Stubberud, Covert Nico, Hawaiian Juicebox, Zoe, Lanzanator, Katarzyna Maraciniak, God, I hope I got that right, Ashlyn Anderson, Brianne Kennedy, Couch Potato Artist, Christopher Portugal, Steve Ma, Lauren Mendoza, and a very special shout out to Arpit Sharma, 
Catherine Engelman, and Neve Breslin. If you'd like to join this list of wonderful people, then you'll find the link to my Patreon on the screen right now, hopefully, and in the description. Your help really does go a long way, and it'll help me improve the production on these videos. Like, I'd like to get some proper lighting now since I'm making some appearances on camera during the video, but just know that by watching and subscribing, your support is still invaluable to me. Once again, thank you so, so much for everything. Um, take care of yourselves. Take care of each other. Bye-bye.